Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to today's session when we're going to be talking about the navigating the new fault lines of retail. My name is Sophie Devonshire and I'm the CEO of the Marketing Society and today we're going to be looking at what those new fault lines of retail are and how brands can navigate them to drive growth and we're going to be doing that with some insights from our friends at Landor and Fitch. Now, before we get started, I have a little challenge for you all today. A quick question. I'm interested in getting a feel from you about your perceptions of how much COVID has really advanced digitization across retail across this last year like no other. So there's going to be a quick poll showing now on your screens. So it would be fantastic if you could let me know, just out of curiosity, if you were to make an estimate as to how much COVID has advanced digitization across retail, not at all, about two to five years, five to 10 years or 10 plus years. What do you think? Looking forward to seeing your perceptions on that. What a year it's been and particularly for retail. It's gonna be a good conversation today as we, we talk about that. So in a moment when you finished voting, we will see what the results are of that. So most of you think that it's advanced a little. 49% of you think two to five years have happened in one year and a whopping 45% of you think actually it's five to 10 years and even a few more than that. So pretty unanimous, of course, in terms of expressing that it has changed things, but how much and what do we do? That's what we're gonna be talking about today. So I'd like to now come back to introduce you all to our speakers today. So we've got some great speakers talking about today's topic. And first up, I'm going to be introducing you to the brilliant Nick Burdett, who is Digital Director for Landor and Fitch, and he leads their digital practice across the whole of the MIA region. Hi, Nick. Hi there, Sophie, and hi, everyone. Pleasure to be here. So a little bit about Nick. He has been delivering, helping everybody deliver the best in digital experiences and innovation across a number of brands, including, I think, Dell and Lego and Adidas and Nestle. And actually, what's great about today is he's going to be sharing one of those stories. So he's going to talk us through Kit Kat's retail transformation in Brazil and talking a little bit about their award winning flagship store and the and shine a light on its recently launched e-commerce experience. So we're going to hear that story today. And after Nick, we will also be welcoming Erin Shields, who has been Defining omni retailing futures for a range of brands for I think over 20 years, right, Erin? At least, at least that's what the grey hairs are saying. Yes. <laughs> Pleasure to be here, everyone. So Erin is the executive director of, of experience strategy for EMEA for Landor and Fitch. And he's been helping shape its retail strategy right across EMEA and developed its core strategic experience framework. So including the Dell, the Dreaming, Exploring, Locating Shop Emissions and its PhD, Physical, Human, Digital, Retail Experience Design Lens. And today, Erin is gonna be sharing some insights on how we can create meaningful retail experiences in this post-pandemic world that we have ahead of us. So a very warm welcome to you both. Without further ado, Erin, over to you. Okay. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, as I said, absolute pleasure to be here. I will just share my screen. Um, it's always great to sort of get the time to reflect on what a crazy year it's been uh, and share some of those insights with everybody. Um, so as Sophie says, the, uh, we're going to be talking about navigating the new fault lines of retail. Um, I will just start off by talking a little bit about Landor and Fitch, two pages only, so don't worry. Um, basically, I'm sure a lot of the audience has heard of Landor and Fitch, um, essentially the the best branding agency um, gets married to the best retail experience agency. What's not to love? And here's uh, two old guys to say that uh, we've been around for a long time. Um, we do a lot over the uh, you know over the decades. We've been around a long time, so you can imagine that we do quite a lot, and that's true. But a lot of it, all of it, uh, revolves around brand, and all of it ends up in being large scale transformation. So working for the uh, the big lovely clients on the big lovely projects. So 
enough about us. Um, there are three, count them three, retail fault lines that we'll take you through today. Uh, I think it's a blessing and a curse we were talking about just before the call, um, saying that may you live in interesting times and what interesting times these are indeed. So without delay, the first one, uh, fault line number one, we're going to talk about re the high street um, renaissance or you know, the rebirth of local. Um, and I, I guess don't want to talk today about uh, community because you can't sort of swing a cat without hearing about, um, you know, the resurgence in, in community. It's all very interesting. Actually, what I want to talk about first is economics. So where are we spending? Where are we spending all of our time now? We don't need to sort of say that, you know, it's very different than how it was, but just in sharp form. Uh, what we, what um, uh, you know, companies like JLL uh, believe is that we're going to be spending uh, 2.6 days uh, in the office on average, which leaves the rest of the time in and around our home. Uh, and what that means is there's going to be sort of new winners and losers. And clearly the biggest losers are uh, places like dense office areas. Uh, it sucks to be Pret right now. Um, and what we're looking at is not just the London phenomenon, but also places like Berlin and Manchester. We see the local areas, these sort of communities, res uh, recovering much faster than the, the city centres. So there's something interesting going on here from, a, um, from an economic point of view. Um, but you can't say that all localities, all, all high streets, are going to be uh, reborn and go through a renaissance. It really depends on a, on a, key, um, on a key facet, which is culture. Um, so if you look on the left-hand side, we see the sort of strength of local culture, uh, cultural offerings. Um, so you see places like Bracknell struggling um, in terms of the, the, the level of culture. And um, uh, KPMG put out an interesting report uh, looking at their post-COVID uh, vulnerability. And you see Bracknell, again, sort of losing out on, um, on their uh, recovery, mainly because we think of the correlation between culture and where people want to spend their time. So we think the, the big sort of um, winners and losers of this are going to be, um, you know, the losers around the simple pleasures, you know, those sort of like going out for lunch around the office districts or, um, you know, the, the continuing decline of, of certain high streets around, the, around uh, Europe, um, really sort of pushing into and, uh, you know, the, see that the winners of these simple pleasures being the rich culture high streets that are found around Europe. So we see, we don't see a resurgence or a renaissance or a rebirth of every single high street uh, around the continent. But what we do see is a, is a, is a strengthening, almost a dividing of rich culture high streets from, from poor culture high streets. And I guess the, the jury's still out on what's gonna happen to major urban shopping areas, retail parks and regional malls. You know, we do think that the, the strong ones will, will carry on. But the interesting thing that we're um, seeing is that we don't think that they're any longer the default choice. So they still have to sort of change, shift, uh, evolve in very sort of quick fashion uh, to meet those bigger days out. Um, so what does this mean for brands? Uh, really, what, the way, the big frame that we see is that um, people have always been hunting for you know, greater authenticity for brands. They expect more. Um, people's attitudes toward um, companies and brands are changing. And one of the major ways that they've done this in the past is looking at um, passion points like cycling, like exercise, like um, these kinds of passion points, which have been around for a long time. Um, but what, increasingly what we're seeing the opportunity is the, the local community as being a, you know, the next battleground for brand building. We think that um, you know, being close to where people live and uh, you know, the, the heart of their kind of proud communities uh, is a really um, easy way to grab relevance or a really sort of effective way, let's say, um, to grab relevance. So um, how do we do that? This comes back to the kind of community question and the community sort of thing that everyone's talking about. What we, what we feel is that a, uh, a service-led and culture-creating series of formats will win out. We don't think the big formats are sort of um, necessary for, to drop into local. We're seeing a lot of really successful retailers like Lush on the right-hand side or like um, Fired Earth in the, in the top right. You know, these guys are bringing out um, really small formats, something like 50 square meters and below. Um, Oaxaca bringing out food trucks um, and, and just creating more relevance with a service-led, not product-led uh, approach because product is obviously sort of, um, you know, being uh, delivered in, in other ways. We don't have to have our full sort of um, assortment of product in the store. We can really sort of focus on how do we recruit and retain customers um, at a local level. Um, and I guess the, the, the good news here is that uh, unlike before, most of those purchases were happening elsewhere and people looked at the high street for essentials. Uh, but this graph is telling us that over 70% of people still want to continue to shop more for non-essentials um, in, their, in their locality, in their high street. 
Um, so we think there's going to be a lot more traffic uh, and a lot more of a business case to focus on. So it's quite ironic that you know COVID has been the thing that could be the uh, the rebirth of the of the high street and the locality, uh, despite all the awfulness that's been happening. So we think that the key here is really once again to grow um, local via service led uh, culture creating formats. Cool. So that's fault line number one and what to do about it. Fault line number two is about um, ecosystem shocks. <clears throat> and what do we mean by that? Well, back in 95, um, Mr. Bezos said that, uh, look, if you can't make a store work, if you can make a store work in the physical world, you probably should. And that was his rationale for um, starting with books because he, his view was that you couldn't put, um, you couldn't create a bookstore that had every book in the universe um, you know, contained within it uh, and, and make that a sort of you know, a good experience. Um, and today, I think the, you know, the, it's really shifted to uh, if you can make a store work in the digital world, you probably should. So this default to physical has changed to a default to digital. It doesn't you know, get rid of physical, but it does change our thinking about how we, um, how we approach the physical retail sphere. Um, one way to do that, one way to sort of, you know, <laughs> try to wrestle ourselves out of this sort of new way of thinking is to, to, to really sort of focus on uh, what missions and mind states uh, customers are going through as they're, as they're shopping. Um, this is these um, Dream Exploring Locating Mind States, as Sophie mentioned, has been, with, um, uh, has been around for 10 years. We've been um, using it that long. It's never been more relevant than now. Uh, and if we think about locating uh, mind states, these are really the ones that we don't want to spend much effort in. So um, if it's about wine, we want to uh, magic our favorite wine into our, our shopping trolley every time it goes on offer. In fact, why don't we subscribe to it? Uh, if it's about cars, maybe it's that company car that we don't need to think about. Um, we just need to get the upgrade whenever it's available. On the other end of the spectrum, when we think about dreaming, if it's about booze, um, it's, it's about planning that, that post lockdown party that we're all sort of dreaming about. And you know, what am I going to sort of put in front of my friends that's going to make that occasion special? I have to go out and learn. I want to be inspired. I want to have fun with these things. Equally, if we think about cars, it's, it's thinking about EV. I don't know anything about EV. What do I do next? It's uh, sort of getting excited about that and learning about that. So um, we can use these mind states to think about how formats are changing and, you know, looking at, I'll show you three different examples now of, of how exciting um, uh, those changes can be and how sort of different from the category um, they, they can be as well. So if we look at automotive, as I've just been talking about, you know, dealers kind of try to run the gambit of, uh, you know, one size fits all to accommodate dreaming, exploring and locating uh, mind states with a little bit of digital um, that's often not very connected to the overall experience. Enter Lincoln Co. So it's a love child between um, Geely and Volvo. Um, we help them watch in China and now in Europe. Um, and the approach to physical retail that we've been taking with them is really centered around developing these um, recruitment and retention uh, clubhouses that we put in one per market. So this is the one in Amsterdam. Uh, and this is the only physical permanent um, uh, uh, format that they have in each of their market. It's really focused around dreaming, that fun, inspiring and educational mind state. We support that through a series of pop-ups which allow people to get sort of more hands-on with the, the vehicles um, and uh, you know get the validation that they require in order to make the decision. And locating, you know, test drive vehicles are everywhere because it's based around um, sharing. So a shareable car that could be rented for the weekend can easily be sort of brought out for a test drive for an hour. And that's the way that um, uh, they're going to, you know, manage the physical sort of formats. Uh, and one, you know, digital app to glue together all the sharing, sales, service, and community functions that um, we need. So we ended up with a, a really different, a really sort of, you know, unseen before kind of format mix where you have... The central um, formats are fixed in the, you know, um, around each center of each market. And then you have a series of flowing um, uh, formats that uh, support it uh, between shared cars and, and nomadic pop-ups. So it's a really sort of different um, retail model and, and mix that we're looking at. Uh, I'll show you one, another one, I'll show you two more. This is uh, the next one, Telco Convention. Everyone sort of knows you've got your flagship standard store and sort of, you know, wholesale partners that retail on your behalf as shown. Um, enter Singtel. So we've got, um, you know, this, this notion of uh, unmanned uh, retail, which has been experimented with quite a bit in China. There's been some successes, some failures. Um, this one was really successful, and we'll tell you why. Again, sort of starting off with the, the dreaming format, we have what we call calm centers, which are 
really about recruitment um, and retention of, of key audiences. They're filled with events, you know, sort of big programs and lots of exciting stuff going on um, in that store. But really the new workhorse um, that's going out there is your unmanned full service uh, stores. So these are 24 seven unmanned stores where you can go in uh, to, it's very secure. Um, you can touch the latest products. You can sort of look at that product you want to buy. Um, you can pick it up in the locker that you can sort of see with all the graffiti onto it next. And you can do, you can get customer service by, um, you know, talking over video screens to, to real agents, as well as, you know, for the easy stuff, just talk to our AI assistant. So in combination, we've got the, the, the best of physical and digital working together. And this is only possible by thinking about the default to digital first. It really sort of switches our minds about, um, you know, what is the art of the possible in this. And thirdly, we have locating um, missions that are achieved um, through these air-conditioned phone booths, really, really small format. Um, they are primarily um, designed for answering customer service queries. So it's the same kind of video calling that um, you can go in here and you can do an, a myriad of different functions. Um, but basically you sort of never need to see um, anybody face to face, um, but still have that very human uh, interaction on call. Cool, so that ends up with a, a slightly different uh, array of formats. So in the center here, we have manned formats and that's our comm center and the call center that supports it. And then we've got the series of unmanned formats that sit around the perimeter around Unbox, which is the sort of medium sized one and the, and the booths. So very, very different again. Um, the third and final example I'll take you through is around discount department store conventions. I mean, the, the well-trodden hypermarket, supermarket and local that, that happen. Of course, we have our store.com, which is a, you know, getting an incredible boost uh, these days. And just talk to you about a, an interesting example around um, Walmart and how this is this this format is really around sort of mobile first. Um, so we talk about dreaming, exploring, locating. This time really is uh, being primarily done through, um, through the mobile app. Um, so we can achieve everything that we sort of want to in, in, that, in that sense, you know, search for a new Father Day, Father's Day presence, um, uh, you know, celebrate sort of Earth Month and everything that sort of comes along with that, or just simply book a, a delivery time slot. And it really changes the way that the physical store operates. I mean, physical used to be more geared toward the exploring uh, mind state. So, you know, try to get people to um, dwell longer and, you know, get more involved in their decisions and choice making. But all that, a lot of that happens now with, uh, with mobile. Um, so really stores become all about um, locating and how do we sort of get in quickly uh, and get out quickly, but sort of spend more time with uh, Walmart and other channels. Um, but one of the interesting things that we noticed as well is that the more time people spend or more, oft more often they spend time on their mobiles in store, the better the MPS. Whoops. There we go. Um, so really what we were inspired by at the end of the day when it came to the physical channel was uh, airports more than other department stores. You can just see how we removed a lot of the cluttered communications, uh, color, you know, everything that you sort of can do in order to help the, the product um, stand out and reduce that all important frustrating orientation time that we know is a, a major um, uh, piece of friction uh, in store. So again, this model is very different where we have mobile at the center, it's sort of doing everything for us and it is surrounded by a, uh, a series of different levels of involvement for, um, for physical channel. So that is the second fault line around ecosystem shocks. And um, I think it's a, this real change in thinking around uh, defaulting to digital first to re-architect that retail um, ecosystem. And, and you know, really now is the time during COVID, so much has accelerated. Um, you know, McKinsey said it was an average of seven years in terms of digitization, and that is really pushing things along. So sort of now is the time to act. So many of our clients are doing this now. Um, fault line number three, final one, uh, we're calling dream.com. And it's, I guess it's really all about, you know, the birth of the, um, of, of e-commerce was really around um, getting this add to basket function right, which is, you know, locating in, in nature. And that's where, you know, everything sort of started. Um, but it doesn't, it, it, it kind of took COVID to help us realize just how dull online shopping can be. And, you know, no matter what the, the retailer or the brand, you know, we've got great brands like BMW and Tiffany and Apple and Warby Parker and the rest of them, it, it's this browsing experience, you know, doesn't live up to the very best of physical experiences that we have. And we think that's, that's set to change. Um, so what we really need to do 
is stop thinking about designing these channels in isolation. We need to stop designing stores with a store mentality. We need to stop designing sites with a site mentality. We almost have to focus on unlearning everything that we've accumulated over the years and really start designing on platforms. But, you know, what the heck does that mean? Well, to explain that, my, my friend and colleague, Nick, is going to take us through um, a case study around Nestle and sort of, you know, help do that justice. Already yeah, thanks, Aaron. So, so for this fault line, like Aaron said, we're going to be going into a bit of a deeper dive case study of, of this point of view put into practice with our partners at, at Nestle and KitKat. And just for a bit of context, we've been working with Nestle uh, for several years on a, on a premiumization strategy for KitKat, which includes the design and pilot of a new chocolatory retail ecosystem. And our first pilot market and case study that we're running through today was for uh, Brazil. So next slide, please, Aaron. Thank you, sir. Uh, so it's a, it was a massive moment for the business. KitKat doesn't have quite the same uh, following and brand equity in South America as it does in Europe. So it was a major growth initiative for their business. You know, Brazil is the largest confectionery market in the world. It's their first foray into direct to consumer in the region. Um, and we have a target audience that's moving rapidly online and demanding more and more from online experiences. Next slide, please. And our brief in brief was, was to create the home of free spirited and playful moments. You know, what a, what a brief. Um, and we really needed to differentiate from any competition and give consumers in the region something, something that they hadn't seen before to really truly deliver impact for the dreamers, the explorers, as well as the locators. Next slide, please. And when it came to the omni-channel strategy, we actually approached it more as an experience strategy that would flow online to offline. So instead of developing a model that was based around a very traditional format strategy, where experiences can really differ massively from channel to channel, we wanted to design a system of touch points that lived online and offline that all delivered the same great experience at every point in the customer journey. A system where users could bounce from a landmark retail space to dot com to social to a pop-up pop activation and receive that great same KitKat experience, always catering to our dreamers, explorers and our locators, no matter the channel. Uh, and of course, the experience needed to feel inherently and unmistakably KitKat uh, at, at every part of the journey. Next slide, please. So instead of mapping out each channel and giving them really single minded missions, we started with, with the services or what we call experience platforms, which is identifying what consumers can achieve with the brand. So to begin with, these platforms are relatively channel and location agnostic. It's really stripping it back to the basics that we can then build an experience onto. And together they make up the, you know, the brand experience DNA. So it's really important that these platforms are very brand centric, so they can be very ownable and memorable. And for KitKat, we focus these platforms around personalization through the Pack Factory and KitKat printing, community through the Break Society, a gamification and play, uh, creating a break playground, and of course, championing the product line uh, through the Pick and Mix platform. And we're gonna show you what that looks like when it comes to life. If we go to the next slide, please, Aaron. So once we've established these platforms, these kind of key drivers of engagement, the next stage is to, or for us here, was to design a concept that brought those platforms together and to life, designing a look and a feel and an interaction that could span both physical as well as virtual environments, underpinned by this consistent experience concept, which for KitKat is a, a wonderland experience, cross-channel, online and offline, anytime, anywhere. Next slide, please, Aaron. So again, just to provide a bit of a bit of context before the dot com, uh, in, in 2019, we launched the first major touch point uh, of, of the ecosystem, which was a landmark physical retail experience in the heart of Sao Paulo. And it was the first launch of our core experience platform strategy. And it was absolutely crammed full of playful moments, including areas to print on your own chocolate, uh, personalized gift packaging, a virtual reality world where we created a, a, a Kit Kat and, and a universe and storyline. A, you know, a host of digital and human services to help bring those platforms to life. And then next up, if we go to the next slide, please, Aaron, was the launch of our .com in 2020, the major growth driver, the opportunity to scale uh, alongside the physical store network that was being rolled over the course of several years. But this was really going to be the driver 
of, of growth across the whole country, which, as we all know, Brazil is an absolutely ginormous region uh, to be uh, facilitating. But of course, in 2020, we had the added challenge of losing access to all of our physical real estate putting even more importance and focus on delivering a dot-com that delivered an enhanced brand experience and not just a flat 2D digital shelf. If we go to the next slide, please, Aaron. And hit play. So how did these platforms actually come together in a, in a direct-to-consumer.com? Well, we thought a film could do a much better job of presenting uh, than I ever could. So welcome to the virtual chocolatory. It's an interactive, playful, immersive, all the buzzwords, uh, chocolate factory, creating a whole new dimension to, to the brand experience while staying true to, to Kit Kat's identity and principles. So we took each platform and we created it like for like um, in, in a virtual experience, really taking advantage of the fact that we had no limits of reality from real estate costs all the way through to physics. We could really play with the design and the UX and the user flow with, with, a, with a whole lot of freedom. And we actually approached the design from more of a gaming mindset. We wanted the experience to feel like you were playing and not purely shopping from an online store, which, which of course is very in keeping with the brand. So uh, please do uh, visit the experience when, when you get a chance. If you go to the next slide, please, Aaron. And just to very obviously show how our like cross-channel platform approach can manifest itself, here we take the pick and mix platform as an example, where we not only took service cues from the physical store, but actually design cues to create this design language that created a, a kind of a familiarity to the platform that would ultimately become a lot more memorable, both online and offline. You can go to the next slide, please, Aaron. So, we, but what we can't do is forget that this is a commerce platform and, it, and it's not a game. So here you can see we, we designed user flows that catered for dream emissions as well as locator emissions throughout the journey uh, to ensure that what we were designing was, was functional as well as inspirational. And that's where kind of part of our design challenge was. It was always about finding the right balance between what was right for the brand, right for the business, and, and what would give the consumer the best possible experience. And the user flow here just, just shows a glimpse of how we take consumers through a journey through the purchase funnel and into the basket, as opposed to being too obviously CTA and basket driven. If you go to the next slide, please. And we took this approach for each and every platform within this virtual.com. So uh, taking this gamified approach to the purchase funnel uh, where consumers would want to explore, you know, and, and lift every rock and find every Easter egg and just generally enjoy the experience. So by blending this gaming and commerce, we were able to keep users engaged for much longer. And, and we've seen the desired response from consumers. Dwell time is, is longer than you would usually expect on a dot-com. Content is viewed far greater as consumers explore the ins and outs of the experience, which has in turn actually driven the average basket size up as a result of users making their way through the entire platform's purchase funnel. If we go to the next slide, please, Aaron. And this approach really gives us longevity and future possibilities to build on. You know, we now have this base of an experience where we can apply new platforms um, and, and new standards of content, which are just going to keep consumers coming back for more and more and not just creating a platform for a one off transaction. And obviously, we've got the kind of core goal of getting people, uh, getting users signed up to the Break Society, a, a subscription service and, and joining the Kit Kat Chocolatory Club and, and movement. So if we go to the next slide, Aaron, we can just show a quick flash of the results that we, we are allowed to share. Um, but essentially, it's, it's been a real success and we've seen great results compared to the original business targets for this launch. We've had three quarters of a million dot com visits. We've had over 300,000 in-store visits while the store was open for a short period of time. Um, we had uh, 50,000 Break Society subscriptions, 50,000 mentions on social, uh, and uh, uh, over 1 million .com interactions. So it's really proving that each user is hanging around and choosing to spend time with KitKat online and offline, and we only see this growing in the future. So if we go to the next slide, Aaron. Right. Cool. So uh, I guess the idea here, as Nick was uh, very well explained, is that we should stop designing stores and sites in isolation and stop, you know, start unlearning uh, what we know works best online and in store and start designing distinctive experience platforms, ones that really sort of 
you know, solve for the um, um, for the mission at hand and the, the the purpose of retail in its own. And, and it's been a, a real pleasure. This is our sort of final slide uh, around uh, what we've learned. Really, the top three things that we've learned in the in the last year, completely different, have changed our sort of you know our practice, our way of thinking. Some of the the tools that we've used have sort of you know help um, help us understand where we need to go, like dreaming, exploring, and locating, and uh, physical, human, digital, like Sophie was mentioning, but you know the, the the ground has changed beneath our our feet, which is why we sort of focused on so much on fault lines. Everyone feels it. What do we do next? Um, it's time to start experimenting um, with high street locations that really are sort of focused around service and around culture creation. Uh, it is time to uh, switch our thinking and think digital first to re-architect um, our ecosystems. And it is time to start designing distinctive experience platforms. Um, these are all we, all, we all know this for sure. Experimentation first, scale next. Cool. So I think with that, we'd just like to thank everybody um, and open up the floor back to Sophie. That's fantastic. Thank you, guys. So interesting. So many stories and stats. And as uh, Simon's just said in the chat, uh, great presentation. Lots in there to play with. Um, I have a couple of questions and I know there's lots coming through from the audience as well, but um, thank you so much for sharing such detail. I, I liked uh, the, uh, the results as well. Always good to see not just what's happening in the theory, but the results. I'm interested in, and perhaps I can direct this question to, to you, Nick, uh, in relation to that last story or just generally. We've got opportunities for brands, of course, now to leverage all these digital tools. But how do they do that without jeopardizing the human element in retail? Uh, yeah, good, good, good question, Sophie. I mean, we really shouldn't be seeing digital as a replacement for, for human interaction. You know, we are humans. We will always need human interaction and, and human empathy. And no digital interface is, is ever going to really replace that. So you've got to use human and digital to their strengths, right? So for me, digitization in in retail is uh, could really be split into sort of two pieces. One is automation, the things that you don't actually need a human to do. And that's, you know, your back of house services, your click and collects, your returns. And the second piece is the storytelling, creating really meaningful moments that kind of communicate the brand and their product. But I mean, take Singtel, for example, which, which Aaron took us through earlier. The concept was a completely humanless store, 24 seven self-serve, uh, and we still have access to a human for when you need it, for any burning questions, for any complaints, or just a general conversation. So digital is really not to be seen as a replacement, but, but more of an enhancer and enabler, if that answers that question. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that, that um, the way in which you can help with the back end and the automation, just make life easier, but then still allow the, the storytelling and, and the human element to come out. I think that's an yeah. important balance, isn't it? So I'm conscious that I mean there'll be all kinds of, of different perspectives from our audience today. I know that the people who signed up will be at different stages of, of their journeys with uh, looking at digital and retail and what's happening and enhancing their online brand experience. But if you had somebody who was just starting to set an objective and saying, I just want to you know, enhance my online brand experience properly, where would they start? What's the starting point for that? So start with the brand. You know, we would recommend always starting with what makes you special in the marketplace. Um, you know, because if you start there, you can get to your kind of really core services, your core platforms, what consumers actually come to you for. Mm -hmm. And it's then around designing the experience where you can really activate those services and platforms. So for anyone who's starting on this journey, I would obviously you have to be consumer focused. You have to understand what your consumers want and what they're going to need from you. But the only way that you're going to really differentiate and create something that's going to be different to anyone else is really starting with your brand. Yeah, yeah. Build, build, build the brand and what it's famous for as well with things like the Break Society and the, and the Kit Kat. Exactly. Well. Yeah. Sorry, Aaron, you, you had, what, what are you going to add to that? To that? Where would you start? Yeah, I agree with Nick, Sophie. I think the, um, the, the trap is to take almost too much of a customer focus. You need to obviously understand customer needs and the rest of it. Uh, but so often what we find with like service design, retail design, UX design, et cetera, is a, a real focus around trying to remove the friction out, mm. of, the, out of the journey to make it less bad. Um, uh, but actually what that ends up doing is creating parity between different brands. 
And what you have to do is focus on increasing more joy, basically, in, in those key moments and understanding what the right channel mix and everything else is, is all uh, part and parcel of it. But I think you have to create that positive friction um, with people in order to be memorable. You know, that's, we have a thing called peaks, uh, you know, piece of thinking, um, which is really about creating, you know, new emotional highs uh, in those journeys. And if you create two of them per journey, you know, per, per mission, as uh, Nick was talking about, then you have a much stronger chance of being remembered. And if you get if you get remembered, all the good things go up. So you know, uh, conversion goes up, advocacy goes up. Um, you know, it's uh, a dwell goes up, rate of return, all those good things. Yeah. So make it memorable, make it joyful. Add that in. Yeah. Um, well, I am a you know, absolutely committed shopper, and I am missing the experience terribly. Um, and I'm also really interested to see, obviously, what's happening with some of the the flagship stores that have been you know abandoned or changing or whatever. I mean, what's the future hold for, for those type of, of stores, Aaron? Is, are they going to be full of joy? Are they still going to be important for brands? Yeah, I think one of the things that um, we, we, we do or we're doing at Landor and Fitch is, is kind of outlawing the term flagship um, because it carries so much baggage with it. You know, it, it sort of started as a, a bit of a folly from the CEO or the CMO to create the perfect sort of articulation of their brand. And while they're great fun, I mean, I love going to know, Burberry on, on, on Regent Street. They're, they kind of are one-offs. Um, and it doesn't talk to their real purpose in the, the overall um, ecosystem. So I think some things have evolved around uh, flagships, around those sort of um, uh, really important recruitment and retention um, formats. Um, but the, I think the, the, the future of them is very different. So they're, they're looked at in much more commercial terms. Mm -hmm. um, these days we have, uh, you know, we have very strict sort of ideas on, on where they should go because they do have a, a marketing purpose. Um, but we believe very strongly they need to do better than wash their own face and have strong, you know, EBITDA returns uh, in them as well. Because as a business, um, you know, vehicle, they need to be sustainable. Yeah. Um, and so I think some things won't change, like they need to be about recruitment and retention, but we see them, you know, becoming much more um, smart places to be inspired, to have fun and to learn something new. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because I mean, I think for, for all marketers right, right now, as we take our businesses and work out how we can drive growth, you know, in this, this new period, post pandemic, the opportunities that they're reshaping or whatever, to make sure that we're fundamentally commercial and we're making sure that the story is there as well as being hopefully creative and, and making it all happen. It's got to, got to really work. And as retailers reshaping, it, it, it does feel like that's important. Folly, folly flagships, I shall remember that. <laughs> um, what about the other extreme then? Um, so uh, my teenage daughters are big fans of, uh, you know, the, the pop-up experience that we've seen so much and we saw so much in London recently. Um, are they still relevant in today's world? I, I think they are. There, I mean, there's so many ways or so many reasons why uh, companies would entertain the notion of doing a pop-up. I think as a pure marketing vehicle, they're interesting. Um, we're, you know, using Lincoln Co. as an example that we, we talk about using uh, pop-up to uh, avoid the cost of, of hard physical, but also not to commit to an area. So, you know, you want to sort of increase the awareness amongst a certain segment of the, of the population. Pop-ups mm -hmm. can be a great way to do that. They're limited in investment, spend, et cetera. Um, and they're a great way to get hands on, on new product. Um, but equally, we're, we're really interested in uh, as, as pop-ups as a way to test markets. So um, we've mentioned sort of Rafa earlier. I think they do a very sort of clever way of, of testing out new locations to see if, uh, if that's going to work for, for their customer groups. Um, so I think they are absolutely relevant. I think they are, again, maturing as a, as a format. So it's, it's, we think of them differently than we did 10 years ago mm -hmm. as a pure sort of marketing exercise. And again, sort of much more commercial returns on them. But they are a way of exploring and testing and uh, understanding a, a micro uh, exploration tool. Yeah, it's a way of it's a way of getting a brand to an audience. If you want to sort of think about it that way, it's a, as as a marketing tool, they can be very effective. Um, but I think both a, for seeding a market as well as um, understanding where you want to touch down and give permanence, um, they're both useful in that direction. Okay, and just going back to the. Uh, the idea of a flagship store, but a flagship store online. Mm. I mean, what are the key characteristics of a really successful online flagship store? What would you say needs to happen? Aaron, do you want me to take that? Or do you want to? Yeah, go, go for it, Nick. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, well, I mean, like I said, it's really 
making sure that your brand is being differentiated and everything that your brand is up. <laughs> Good question. Uh, let me think about this for a second. Mm -hmm. Well, I think just while, while Nick's thinking, um, you can see we've used this dreaming, exploring, and locating um, mm -hmm. framework. Um, flagships for us are really about a focus on the, on the dreaming uh, mindset. So the ones that are about, you know, the fun, the, um, the learning and the inspiration. Uh, they're the ones who are trying to convince people to, to think about the brand differently um, and to um, you know, recruit new audiences and to spend time. So we're, we're, we're going out and we're doing more than just setting out a stall. We're, we're trying to tell better stories. We're trying to have better engagement. We're trying to make it shareable. We're trying to basically um, help people fall in love with our brand, um, maybe for the first time, maybe all over again. So those are the, the best characteristics of, a, of an online flagship. Love that, get them to fall in love with you. Um, there are so many questions coming through you guys. I know we are not gonna have enough time to answer every single one of these questions. So for everybody who's, who's submitting questions, if we don't get to them today, we'll make sure they're sent out in the follow-up email. So do, do look out for that. Um, I'm just gonna pick one question from, from the audience here for, for, to, to ask you guys. Interesting one here from, from Anne, Anne Leathers, who's asking, why was the dot, dot com for KitKat Brazil, so this is probably one for you, Nick, why was the dot com for Kit, I can't speak, for KitKat Brazil launched second and not in collaboration with a physical location? It was so, just to make a really big bang in the, um, in the city. We really wanted to drive people into the store. And we felt that if the dot com was launched at exactly the same time, it would actually harm the amount of people that were actually going into store so it was very deliberately a timed delivery where we wanted to create the brand experience first create that real landmark that people were driven to would share online which was going to create you know fantastic content um, to really sort of scale and then the dot com was always a supporting uh, the kind of the second stage of the process um, if that answers that really interesting yeah the, the, the timing and and to, to get that right i love it um and let's pick one of the questions so so Rob Allen is asking, how do you find the sweet spot between a flagship experience and the wider retail footprint? Hmm. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. It's a good question. Um, and and it, it kind of harks back to the, the local sort of um, renaissance, the high street renaissance thing as well. And ironically, um, you know, flagships in the, in the past have been built for very high footfall, um, but very high frequency as well. So, and you know, what we've learned over time is that, you know, actually visits to flagship locations. So, you know, whether that is, uh, you know, going to Fifth Avenue in New York or going down to Oxford Street only happen a couple times a year um, for, you know, local residents. None, they don't spend every weekend going down there, right? It's a lot of it is driven by tourism. So you can look at the people who are sort of coming to these locations and make a judgment of um, of how of, of what kind of format to put there. So it's less about um, size or investment, and it's much more about the destination traffic and and the characteristics of it. So a typical flagship, you know, Oxford Street location is going to have very low frequency but very very high um, footfall. And so what do you want to do? You want to sort of put a bit of spectacle in there to try to attract as many people from that destination as possible and get them to fall in love with the brand, as we were saying. Mm. A local, uh, you know, more workhorse kind of um, format is a very different um, thing. So whether that's in a mall or whether that's in a, a local high street, you're getting a, a, a lower number of uh, footfall, but a much higher level of frequency. So people in malls go there potentially once, um, uh, once a week or a few times a month. Uh, people on a local high street, even more. Um, so actually the, the needs change. Um, it doesn't have to be spectacular because you can't be spectacular, you know, uh, you know, two or three times a month, right? Yeah. It, it becomes much more about being sort of uh, having some reliable experiences that are very enjoyable, some community aspects that are great. Um, but also, you know, what, what, is, what, is, what is in there that's going to um, uh, convince people to sort of spend time with you? Um, so you still have to have those sort of dreaming uh, aspects that are in there, so we argue. Um, but also you can just, um, uh, yeah, but that's it. So <laughs> some dreaming aspects that are in there. But I think what you want to think about is the, is, is the characterization of the, of the destination as opposed to, you know, thinking, overthinking the, the large, medium, small kind of, uh, you know, thinking around formats in the past. I love that. That's brilliant. Okay. 
one question, last question. I'm going to squeeze one more in. So please, let's do this one super fast. But um, it's, a, it's a really interesting one here, I think, from, from Rachel. If, if everyone is using digital, both operationally and store design fit out, wouldn't the landscape be somewhat overwhelming, confused with, for example, the mall environment where the landlord also has digital? So what's the right mix? Yeah. That's a really good. That's a really good question. And I guess digital, when done right in a physical experience, it, it's it's invisible, right? It's it, it, it's all about the content. You made the, the the tech almost invisible. So it's a it's a really good point. But you know, from the from the back of house perspective, I mean, digital is only going to be helping store designers and store operators really make a much more efficient. Um, a much more efficient store without having to worry about all the all the staff hours, et cetera, et cetera. And then from an in-store um, experience, from a, from a consumer perspective, it's a really good point because you don't we don't want to put screens on every wall, you know, against every single pole because at that point it's it's screen overload, and you know we're all completely used to that over the past twelve months. Yeah. So it's really about sort of pinpointing the role of what of what digital is going to achieve? Is it creating a product deep dive moment? Is it creating a moment of pure storytelling? Uh, is it an in-store app to, to help you go in and collect? You, you really have got to think quite strategically and tactically about where you're using digital and not just literally painting the store with, with it. Yeah, I think the, um, if I can build on that is, I recall, you know, shopping at the Selfridges Beauty Hall, which is, you know, a remarkable piece of, I know, I can't wait to run <laughs> through Selfridges when it opens. But um, re recall, you know, going there six, seven, eight years ago, it was awash with digital screens um, from all the, um, you know, really sophisticated um, brands that, that occupied the space. And, you know, some of that was about, uh, you know, a new routine uh, that you can do excellent content on like a a five step, you know, morning routine uh, or taking better care of your skin or whatever the topic was, there was a digital sort of display and interaction, which was all quite high quality. But when you looked at what was happening, those screens were, were not attended. You know, they, nobody went to them. They went there to, in the, in the famous words of Rodney Fitch, to, to touch something or to talk to somebody you know this is the core purpose of of physical retail and they were they were busy talking to the beauty consultants they were trying on the the makeup and beauty products uh, on, on their own um and, and you go to the beauty hall today and the only digital things that you really see are either a staff a staff tablet that help take orders or you know big sort of large format screens that broadcast the brand and you know the lush sort of you know give it atmosphere I think that's what really works in that scenario. But all, all you know, time has erased all the rest of it. And like, you know, Nick says, uh, you know, the, the functional stuff has become sort of, in, you know, it's still there, but it's invisible to the to the physical experience. Oh, it's so interesting. Honestly, we could talk about this for hours. And I know from the questions coming through that everybody would love to, too. But I, that's all we've got time for. So what I want to do, most importantly, is to say a massive thank you to Nick and to Aaron and everyone at London and Fitch for sharing those perspectives with us.